You're listening to another episode of the Young Investors Podcast, so sit back and relax as myself, Brandon, and my buddy Hamish discuss the latest in the world of finance and stock market investing. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing and you need some help, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with all that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm back, Hamish. You're I'm back. back, but I'm not, I'm not really back because no. I'm actually in Fiji. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a weird, like I said, at the end of last week's episode that you would have seen by now uh i said that uh we didn't really know what was going to be happening over the next couple of weeks because we yeah we recorded last week and you were supposed to be with us but your power yeah. went out so it was just me and tom but that was also just two days ago for me and the episode isn't released <laughs> so my mind my- <laughs> this is the whole thing isn't it about like scheduling content yeah. for the future so where like we you- are and where you guys yeah. are is completely different uh it's absolutely yeah <laughs> But that's okay. Yeah, sorry I couldn't make it. I, I was actually supposed to be on the podcast yes. for last week's episode. Um, but yeah, we just had a power failure in our building. And I unfortunately cannot record a podcast if I do not have any power. Yeah, there's not much so you can really do about uh, that. So, that was very annoying. But no. I, uh, I listened to last week's podcast um, and I thought you guys were really good. That was a fantastic episode. Oh, thanks. Appreciate um, it. Yeah. I'm, all, I'm all already anticipating the comments that are going to be like, just ditch Brandon no. for good and keep, <laughs> keep keep Tom. No, but <laughs> Tom is actually very, very, he's very sharp. He always has a lot to say. He's very oh, well researched. So, yeah, we should always have him on uh, more often. I said that in, in last week's episode. So, mm. um, yeah, yeah, I definitely think we, we should. But, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed last week's episode. Wasn't kind of news related, although I guess the, the 13F filings is, you know, relatively news worthy. Um, it, it only happens once every quarter. But uh, this week, of course, we're pre-recording again. Uh, so we're not going to be going into any news topics uh, that will kind of mm. be more than a week old um, by the time you're listening yeah. to this. But uh, instead- The news hasn't happened yet for no. us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we'd have to be predicting the future if we we're going to get the news right for the week. What would we have to be? I don't know. Oh, yeah. we never stray away from pre- from making our predictions, do we? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, it wouldn't be too off brand. No, but we're. <laughs> what, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to go through kind of just a bit of a guide for for people getting into investing. So there's always you mm. know a lot of people I'm sure who listen to this podcast who are either just started investing or are thinking about getting into it, and that this is kind of your uh, you know gateway into it. So we wanted to yeah. talk about how we got started. Uh, so kind of what was our first initial couple of years going into investing uh, and then what we were going to jump into. We could jump into some some of the books that we read when we started out so that you guys can kind of see the resources that we used. Uh, and then we're just going to go through some quotes that uh, from famous mm. investors and kind of explain a little bit more about what they mean because some of them are yeah. really great. They sound snappy, but it's also, I think, valuable to dive into, you know, mm. what is actually meant by, by, by yeah. those short quotes. So. Kind of gets your uh, th- those quotes kind of set your investing mind frame, like how you should be thinking about investing. Yeah. Um. So I think they're really good to go through. Yeah. Um. But yeah. All right. Should should we'll just fly through the sponsor and then let's just uh let's get get into it. Yeah. I guess. So today's episode is sponsored by ShareSite, which is an application you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. So you can bring in all of your trades uh, either automatically by connecting your broker or your brokers, uh, or you can do it one by one or using or using Excel. And once you do that, it will track all of the gains and losses in your portfolio. So capital gains, uh, dividends. If you have dividend reinvestment plans, it will do those calculations for you. Currency gains, if you're buying shares internationally or you hold foreign currencies, and then you can use it for when it comes to tax time. So ShareSite generates up to 12 different reports that can be used to track the performance of your portfolio uh, and use the tax time to work out things such as capital gains, dividend income, and more. And at the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to ShareSite.com forward slash young investors. That's uh, site spot S-I-G-H-T, ShareSite.com forward slash young investors. So use that link, sign up to a free plan. You can track up to 10 holdings for as long as you want, or you can also use that link to sign up to a premium plan for more features and you'll get four months off a yearly subscription if you use our link. So go check it out. And thanks as always uh, to people who've used that link and is supporting the podcast. Also, I forgot to mention, um, I finally got yes. my both of my soundproofing up in my office. So hopefully the audio oh, yeah. is a little bit better. Um, I can definitely notice uh, the, the difference from when, when I had, mm. so I have, I can't really show 
um, unfortunately. But no, uh, yeah. I had uh, I have these kind of massive sound blankets that I got that were really expensive, but they're actually so good at just like killing the sound uh, and the echo. Mm. It's so good. I don't know. It's kind of boring, but I, yeah. <laughs> no, no. It's definitely. I remember when I came to your place and you had the sound blankets up and I like spoke into them. I was like, oh yeah. my gosh, this is crazy. It just sucks up the sound. Yeah. But honestly, like, I think that just our uh, our uh, microphones just by themselves, like yeah, especially the ones good. we use for the podcast. Oh, yeah. do you use that one for your videos? I as use well? this for my videos as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, even the the they're pretty good at just blocking out any sound that's not immediately your voice yeah but no, it's definitely handy to have those sound blankets up as well yeah especially in like a small because this is a pretty small room so with nothing bit echoey, bare walls, yeah. it does you can definitely tell especially That's if you true. watch if you watch my videos with headphones on you can definitely hear an echo so hopefully that'll be um, right. cut out a little bit funny thing is i use those um i use those command hooks to hook up <laughs> to put you know those like hooks where you it's basically like yeah. you can stick them on the wall and then they're removable the sticky ones and mm. uh each hook is uh, can take 1.2 uh, kilos, and there's six of them, so 7.2 kilos, and the blanket mm. weight is 7.24. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if throughout this I'm podcast just for it. you just hear a massive bang, or suddenly there's like a blanket over the top, and I get knocked off, <laughs> I get knocked onto the ground. That's what's happened. The the extra uh, you know, 0.04. <laughs> so, that's it. You could you couldn't just uh, you couldn't just invest in one extra hook. No. Well, that <laughs> is the thing. They came in packs of six and they were like 12 oh, okay. bucks so i was like am you i gonna pay am i really gonna one. pay another 12 dollars you yeah. know for that extra 0.04 <laughs> <laughs> and they're all gonna break uh, and then i'm gonna have to buy two more sets so uh that'd be hilarious yeah no, I, I, I think I'll, I'll chuck a couple more hooks up but i just wanted to get the one first <laughs> if you like knock it if you if you just unbalance it at all it's just all going to come crashing yeah. down my dog will it's grab gonna rip your roof off or something <laughs> yeah my dog will just grab the bottom of it and just tug slightly just a tiny <laughs> bit of weight bang <laughs> yeah uh, oh dear well i hope that doesn't happen no no, no it's held up it's been up for a few days it's been uh, it's been good anyway that's that's my <laughs> anyway. that's my boring news. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, as as Hamish was saying before, in this in this podcast, we kind of just want to go through almost like a bit of a beginner's guide, especially relevant um, when the market goes down. A lot of people get interested in the market. Maybe people that um, haven't you know really paid any attention to stocks or anything before. So uh, yeah, in, in this in this podcast, I think we'll just kind of go through how we originally got started investing. We don't have to. Doesn't have to be a brief history of nearly everything but you know we'll yeah. just kind of yeah, talk about how yeah it started on the 30th of january 1990 it was a cold morning <laughs> I, I was born in adelaide <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Uh, but yeah we'll go through that and then we'll go through some uh some, some books that we kind of recommend that have been influential in how we've started and some quotes at the end so yeah you, hamish hotter now you, you take us through yours myth. first you take us through yours i i already did story time this morning with my uh my sound blanket. Oh, so okay. tell us, tell us how okay. you got started. <laughs> All right. Oh, well. It was the 30th of January, 1995. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so my investing journey started um, kind of at the end of my university degree. Cause uh, for those that don't know, I, I went to, um, to uni and studied physiotherapy. And um, at the end of the degree, I was kind of looking at jobs and, and started realizing that in the physio profession, I was never going to really make the kind of dollars that I, I just wanted to make for the stuff that I wanted to do for where I wanted to get to in life. Um, so I quickly started looking at ways to compound your money, um, how to turn your money into more money. And like, I literally knew nothing about the stock market. Some would argue I still know nothing about the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I just started... Um, hearing about passive income and investing and blah, blah, blah. So I started taking an interest in it. Um, none of my family were really into investing at all. So n my immediate family. So I had to uh, call up my uncle and uh, my uncle is a kind of like a superannuation advisor. Uh, he's a financial advisor to do with superannuation. So um, so I called him and he was kind of like, yeah, you know, investing's great, long-term wealth, um, ETFs are great, you know, own a little bit of the whole market, you know, listed investment companies, you reinvest those dividends and kind of snowballs, listed invest, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, what's the big one in Australia? Australian Foundation Investment Company. 
Um, that was the one he recommended to me, um, which like looking back at, at that time to where it is now would have been very, very smart to just put all that money in there. Um, <laughs> so I did that a little bit, but of course, being the young, naive <laughs> person that I was, what did I do? I just started picking stocks, you know, <laughs> yeah. as you do, you know, saw a couple of YouTube videos. Some people uh, recommended this, recommended that. So why not? Got into some stocks and then... Um, didn't take very long for me to, to to realize that that's not how you invest. <laughs> yeah, how? Because uh, those those stocks did not do very well. Yeah. So were you? Uh, we'll get to mine as well. But were, were you kind of in, investing in individual stocks for a while before you switched to you know more of a value investing approach, or came across the value investing approach, or was it kind of a, more of a quick? Transformation, like you- yeah, it was it was pretty quick. So I I did do what my uncle told me to do. I bought some like uh, AFI shares, the the long term listed investment company. Yeah, that that was the one he recommended. So I just went with it. Um, I didn't really understand like just the whole pure market tracking ETF style, yeah. um, passive investing that what we talk about all the time. So I just went with the AFI shares. Um, but then I was, you know, I think like, for instance, Roger Montgomery, he had a YouTube channel. He's like an Australian fund right. manager and he was, mm. he talks about like, he was talking about some company called ServeCorp. I couldn't even tell you what, the, I think they do like <laughs> shared office space or something like that. Yeah. And then um, like Vita Group was another one. That's like the biggest, that's like the opposite of a moat company. They're, <laughs> they're, reliant, they're reliant on Telstra to make sales. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're like the retail. They were like the retail kind of wing of uh, of Telstra, right? Or they had like some of the stores or something like. Yeah, they no, they're their own business. They had an agreement with Telstra oh. to operate um, their retail oh, stores. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So they did that anyway. So I like started buying into. The, I'm sure there was some more, but I've I've forgotten them now. Yeah, I, I can't remember. There was definitely some more. Anyway, I started buying them. They they all, like, it was probably good that this happened, mm. in all honesty. It's good because they all did horribly, but the AFI shares did really well. Yeah. It, it's funny because so that kind of- that's, like, such a good lesson in a way because you mm. didn't probably weren't investing that much money getting started. No, definitely not. And fortunately, you got burned probably, you know, just not doing enough research in some in, in individual yeah. companies. And you also got to see, wow, if I just passively invest, that, you know, has done quite well. Even though that over the short term, maybe neither of those things was that, you know, you, you probably couldn't read all that much into the short term, but it gave yeah. you the lesson that you needed. Um, yeah, absolutely. Whacked me across the chops. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was at that point, I think, that I came across Phil Town on YouTube mm. and, you know, he was talking about, I, th- I can't remember what I was watching, but he was talking about how some of these mistakes I was making are obvious mistakes. You don't want to just copy someone. It's like here at rule one, you know, we're all about long-term investing, the the right way to go about it, you know, and he starts talking about these Warren Buffett principles. And I didn't really know much about Warren Buffett other than he was super rich and that he, he, was, he was an investor. So I started watching Phil Town's content on YouTube and that led soon led me to reading his books. And that's when I started to realize that – the Warren Buffett approach to investing, like that is the correct way to go about it if mm. you want to be a, an individual. Like that is the rational long-term investing strategy that that legitimately does build wealth. Yeah. And you can make an argument that most other things are just speculation. What I was doing was just speculation. So that kind of course corrected me a little bit. Um, to, and that got me on the, on the path where now I, I kind of understand that there are really – two long-term investment strategies, passive investing and Warren Buffett style active investing. And now mm. I do both of them. Yeah. And I certainly do not speculate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no speculation for me. Thank you. Yeah. It, it is funny because I, I had kind of a similar learning experience as well, getting started to, to you in, in, in not, yeah, tell not, me about not your, super that's similar. That's pretty much my story. You tell um, me about your story. Not, not super similar, but certainly had some like early learning experiences that really kind of crafted, um, I think, or just like, kind of moved me towards Warren Buffett value style investing. Um, but yeah, so I, I started, essentially, I, I at the end of high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just, and I was kind of interested in business. I'd already kind of started a couple, you wouldn't really call them businesses, but I'd like buy stuff online and sell them to 
kids at school. So I was already kind of into business a little bit. So hey, Mishota hats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's talk. We won't get into that. But right, it, well, right. I mean, we could. I mean, it actually did. Um, it did quite well. So this was like in. Um, I think this was like year nine. So I was probably like fifteen years old or something. And I, for some reason, everyone was just getting at everyone at high school was just getting into these like the, these like basketball snapback caps. Like mm. everyone just was yep. trying to buy them. And in Australia, they're like, if you get genuine ones at least, they're like fifty dollars. Like if you just go into right. like Foot Locker or something. So these hats are so expensive. Um, so I just decided I just like went online. I was just like looking up like if you could like find like how to like get cheap hats. And you could I found this website where you could wholesale them for like eight dollars each. So I would take orders. So I wouldn't even just buy them yet. I would just take orders, and then when I had enough orders, I would buy in bulk. And then they'd have to wait like two weeks, and then they would come. What I re- didn't nice. realize I did was I was basically doing like drop shipping. <laughs> <laughs> you were to kids in high school. <laughs> Um, Except so, fulfilled by Hamish. Yeah, yeah, fulfilled, <laughs> fulfilled yeah, by Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah FBH. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, I had a bit of interest in business, um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do at the end of high school. So I just went and studied finance, um, like commerce, and then just, uh, majoring in finance. And it was like right at the beginning of this degree where I was just again, same as you, just interested in kind of making money and and looking for ways to compound wealth and get set up for the future. So um I started kind of looking into investing. And yeah, like you, I was kind of I don't think I bought I don't think I bought an ETF in the first year. So I didn't have kind of that structure at all in the first year when I was investing. I bought just a couple of individual businesses. One was uh, right. one was National Australia Bank, uh, which I held for for quite a while. Um, but it, that wouldn't have been too bad, right? You would have just gotten oh, they had a bit did. of drama, but that you would it have did just okay. Been it paid dividends with that. Yeah, it, I think the stock was down from when I bought it initially, but the dividend was like eight percent per year or something yeah. insane. Insane. <laughs> um, so that <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, 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 that was down for a very long time though before it kind of came back up and, and yeah, eventually I just got rid of it. But what else did I buy? It was. Um, Oh, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was a telecommunications company. It started with uh, V. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, oh. Oh, I think I, Vocus. Vocus Group. Yes. So um, right. Yeah. So that was that was another one that I bought. Again, I know nothing about telecommunications. So that was just. <laughs> yeah. It was just one of those like random speculative kind of um, picks. Um, it ended up getting. Uh, yeah, I ended up selling it for like a couple months later. It was a very kind of short term thing Uh, i think it was up slightly but yeah it wasn't you know any skill involved it wasn't until kind of a little bit later that year that uh i just happened to be in uh i was actually in europe and i was just looking for some books just to read on the plane and i went to this bookstore and just went to the business section and there was a massive the business section was pretty small like it was you know like Mm -hmm. most bookstores it's kind of the hiding in the corner behind cobwebs where no one reads it Um, (laughs) but it happened to have this massive display of the intelligent investor and i don't know if it was because a new uh release had come out it I'm not. Sh- I don't know if like there'd been like a new like a, uh, you know where they've just kind of like put a new cover on it or something like that. Yeah, but yeah. there was a massive display, so I was just immediately drawn to it, and that just happened to be the first like real investing book that I read. Um, right. So it's kind of funny that you you kind of intelligent just, investor. Like there could have been anything on that stand. Like that could have been that could have been Harry Potter, and I could have had a you know. <laughs> <laughs> could have, could, you would have completely missed the boat. Welcome back, my <laughs> wizards, like the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll be doing a Harry Potter podcast right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. This could have been. This could have been anything. This could have been really weird. Um, so, <laughs> no, um, so that was kind of the first book that I read, and that like was a huge grounding from going from just picking some random companies to. Um, actually having kind of a, a, a reasonable approach um, to, to thinking about businesses or stocks from like business ownership. Uh, and then from there, uh, really, I think I came quite quickly across Phil Towns books because it was just kind of a natural beginner step into uh, into Warren Buffett, you know, value investing. Um, yep. And yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's kind of where I, I started out. One th- and now you're here. And, and now I'm here. One, one thing I did want to mention <laughs> was, because uh, you were talking about kind of mistakes, in early 
2018 was when I made a massive mistake. Well, it was a it was a mistake that I think was a really big learning experience for me. And that was with Thor Industries, which is still in my portfolio today. I think it's an amazing company. Um, but the mistake I made was at the time, I was kind of just doing very, very basic uh, valuation. So what should I pay for the business? I was really just doing kind of looking at the past growth and just projecting growth into the future. Uh, and I got absolutely burned with the first bit of money that I put into Thor Industries. And that was a massive learning lesson because it shifted me from just doing basic projections to actually thinking rationally about where a business can be in the future. I actually, once the stock had gone down a bunch, I was like, right, let's sit down and think if the industry grows at this rate, uh, this is how many units they'll be selling. If they can sell them at this price, it was a real learning curve of like, Mm. this is what's necessary to figure out what businesses are worth. Um, So that was kind of an early lesson that helped. Definitely, yeah, there are definitely those moments where you get, you know, the whip cracked on you when you yeah. think, oh, yeah, I've, I've done my research, you know, social media, I like it. People like social media. All right, Facebook. And then you're like, yeah. oh, hang on, hang on a second. No, no, there's a bit more to it than that. Yeah. You know? Or, or so- something like that. Well, you realize that you really, you've kind of, in a way, convinced yourself that you've done enough. Yeah. But then you're like, oh, actually... I need to do a lot more. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, investing is just a constant process of doing more um, with each additional investment. And like the more you yeah. learn, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> the more yeah, that the is more true. You, the more yeah. questions you have, um, and you really, I, I think at the start there's a there's a steep learning curve to getting into the the ga- if, if this is individual investment, which a lot of people might not do anyway. But there's like a steep learning curve, and then you get to like a plateau where you think you're a genius. And then, and then, and then there's another like quite, and then you kind of real, you look up and you realize it's this kind of constant steep uphill where you just constantly learn more. And even, you know, 10 Mm. years into investing, I'm sure there'll be still more that you can learn or or different ways that you can think about, um, approaching businesses. So, yeah. Mm. It's like when I, when I think that I understand, like I've done a little bit of research on a stock and then I hear a lecture by Monish Pabrai and then he's like, but then what I actually realized is that this is how the business works. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, but there you go. That's a, that's an interesting background. I mean, yeah. And now we're here somehow. And now, now we're here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah kinda- years later. Doing an investing podcast every week. Yeah. It, it, making it, investments. It is funny because, yeah, I, I guess both of our passion for investing kind of just funneled us towards looking for community in a way. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, we, we ended up creating um, some communities, um, which has obviously been, I think, extremely yeah. valuable for us. I mean, it, it kind of, in a way, it was me starting the channel and even doing the podcast is partly partly for selfish reasons it was it was i wanted community uh in investing and yeah, didn't 100%. have that in 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 real life so um it is interesting yeah. how everything kind of kind of moves <laughs> yeah one of the things that i thought about for back when i first started the channel is i wonder if i start this channel like whether people like i can learn from people that leave comments kind of thing mm because I started my channel like in the very early days after I'd made all those mistakes because I think my first couple of videos were like all the sh- all the mistakes I'd made and stuff like that. Like, oh, yeah, me too. Hey, guys, it <laughs> turns out listed investment companies aren't actually that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think like one of my first videos is on like listed investment companies. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, I, I totally just thought that we could. And, and I guess we have. You get a million i mean the youtube comments honestly are pretty useless at this point with the <laughs> in terms of useful like with the amount of spam and whatnot yeah but you still get people discussing things in the comments and, and learning and that is the you know hearing opinions yeah that's the one sad thing i think about the comment section is once when you have a smaller channel it was people genuinely well there still is yeah, there so still good. is this but at the beginning it was like almost all people genuinely engaging with the content and there was a lot of good yeah. feedback and that still exists I'm sure but it's buried among a pile of bots and people just who've garbage. just come across your channel and they look at the sub count and they're like oh why does this guy have this and like just is just salty yeah. and it's just it's yeah. it's not fun to go through comments anymore it's, it's I, yeah. I rarely go it's through sad, comments which is sad because I know that within the comments there's a lot there's probably a lot of like people who are really engaged in the content but 
it's just a, it, it's, yeah, I spend, I, I, mm-hmm. I plan on going through comments for five minutes just to like read through some comments and reply. And I spend 20 minutes deleting bot comments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I spend probably 10 minutes deleting them and then like it doesn't stop. No. So I'm just like, it. what am I, am I going to sit here for literally like 10 hours today and just delete, yeah. delete, delete? Yeah, I mean, you, that's literally literally more than a full time job yeah. just to delete spam. There's fake um, young investors accounts now. Have you seen that? Hmm? There's like copy young investors accounts on in our. Wait, are you being serious? Yeah, yeah. In the comments of the young investors YouTube, like wow. there's the fake ones. Even even our tiny little YouTube it's channel, a, it's for not the young even investors podcast. Yeah. It's, kind of has crazy. Spam. That's ridiculous. I mean, I on this note as well, I know this is a bit of a tangent, but um, the, I, I, I was planning on going back onto Instagram um, after my, so my, I had, there was a bunch of spam accounts. Then my account got wrongly deleted and then I was off for like a year. I came back and I, we posted some stuff during the US tour. Um, but there's just so many spam accounts on Instagram. I just can't. Yeah. Now my Instagram bio is just Instagram is boring and it's too spammy. Come follow me on Twitter <laughs> because at yeah. least on Twitter, I think some people have spam accounts for them, but they haven't got to me yet. So um, all my yeah. all my comments on my Twitter posts and everything is all genuine. So it's just it's just a lot cleaner than than anywhere else. So yeah, um, yeah it is kind of sad that they haven't got it's, it on top of, or found a way to get on top of that problem. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Yeah, pretty sad because it makes it pretty useless for for people like us and people that follow us, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, um, moving on. So that they that's our background. That's how we kind yeah, of got into we... it. Um, and then I think investing, hmm. I'm sure you can learn a lot from university. Um, I'm sure you can do courses and learn about this stuff as well. But I think to learn the Warren Buffett way of investing, the best way or even, you know, people's interpretations of that, the best way you can do it is just by reading books. Yeah. I think that's that's pretty much the, the the way that most investors kind of do their do their learning. So I thought, um, Hamish, do you want to take us through some um, yeah. some books that uh, it doesn't even have to. It can be whatever you want, but books that have really helped you mm. um, in your education as an investor. Yeah. One thing I will say before we go to the books, um, the only thing that I haven't gotten from these books that I think was really valuable that I did get from university was accounting. Um, that right. for me was so boring, but it was kind of like, I feel like the university structure forced me to learn what is essentially the language of finance. Um I, but with that said, I'm sure there's some incredible uh, accounting resources outside of university, things like Khan mm. Academy on YouTube, or I'm sure there's a bunch of books that you can get access to, to to broaden your understanding of accounting. But that would be one that's not in this list um, that I would say is very, very valuable. But I think the first kind of personal finance, not really investing, but personal finance book that I read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, which is funny because I think it's the first book for a lot of people for some reason. Yeah. It's kind of a small book. Guilty. It's a small book, has a kind of a quirky, interesting title. Um, and it's really good. You, you're not going to learn anything specific, but it, it, it changes your mindset. Uh, and that's what everybody says b- before, after mm-hmm. they read this book is it changed my mindset completely. And I didn't really believe people, but it, it really does. It gives you a huge perspective shift that, uh, I, I just never had because probably similar to you, no one in my family was, you know, you know, particularly wealthy or, or, or into investing or just these things weren't, you know, value or ran a business. None of these things were things that were familiar to me. I've even said for a long, most of my, for a very long time, I didn't even think you could run a business. I thought it, for some reason they were just all, I never really thought about it. I just thought there were like yeah. corporations that were like, I don't know, family run or some like, you know, I just yeah. I just thought it was something that was out of the what, possibility. I, can do that? <laughs> I didn't even like, it didn't even click with me. Um, yeah. So this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, kind of helps you break down, I think, some of those barriers um, mm. in how, uh, you know, people, uh, you can take your money and, and put it into assets that produce more money and, and start this kind of compounding um, process. Yep. Rich Dad, Poor Dad was uh, the first one on my list for just personal finance, not specifically investing, but personal finances. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically focuses on two different stories 
as the title suggests, one's a rich dad, one's a poor dad. I actually think the, I mean, it's written as though this is real, but I think Robert Kiyosaki made the whole thing up. To <laughs> yeah, be perfectly he honest. definitely made it up. <laughs> yeah, um, but but yeah, it, it essentially what he's trying to demonstrate with those two uh, 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 narrative lines is how different people think about money. Yeah. And like, you know, the, how, like some of the titles are called like how the rich treat money and that sort of thing. It's like once they get that wealth, what do they do with it? Do they just spend it? No, they save some of it. They invest a lot of it into cash producing assets, which generate more income. It goes into like compounding, that sort of thing, which, you know, you might, I mean, I think if you read it, you'd enjoy it no matter what you, what, what level you're at. But um, you might find it a little bit simplistic, but I, I think it's a really good, like foundational book to get you on track in personal finance. Yeah. Um, I had one, one more uh, kind of personal finance book that I actually read after I'd kind of learnt a lot of, a lot of, I guess the, the basics of personal finance. I actually read it like last year, I think. Um, and that was the richest man in Babylon. So I thought this is a, this is a, again, a very short book. Um, it's written like uh, as though we're we're back in ancient Babylon or whatever that time period was, and it's just a set of parables, stories essentially. Um, and each story, it's set in that time frame, is is designed to teach you a lesson about personal finance, and it's very well structured. Um, so you go through the book and you're learning about these different characters and different stories and what they're doing with you know their labor and their income and and their their homes and that sort of thing and and learning about you know the foundational um yeah the the foundational the building blocks of uh, of personal finance and mm. and wealth creation so i thought that i'd recommend that one as well yeah it's it's it, honestly it's been one that's uh, on my shelf but i haven't uh, i haven't read it yet actually so i've had it there for probably like 5 years <laughs> yeah. i just for some reason never it's one of those never, ones where yeah. for you if you read it now you probably wouldn't learn anything that's specifically new but it's good to just reaffirm those kind of habits Go back over it all, cement it a little mm. bit more. Maybe it it, um, it it draws out something that you're you're not doing or you could be doing better. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, so g- going on, you know, as I said, kind of earlier, um, the intelligent investor. I think it's a difficult book. Uh, certainly, if you're it's very difficult, if you're Hamish, it's, very difficult. It, yeah, it shouldn't be understated how difficult this this book is, and a lot of it is going to be stuff you don't understand the first time and I think that's okay. I think just 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 push through it or even picking out a couple of the key chapters like the margin of safety chapter. What's the other one you yeah. said? It was like chapter 8, I think. Um Chapter 8 is the, is the Mr. Market kind of chapter. Yeah, so there's, there's a it's really a, a combination of uh, ways to think about stocks from a business perspective, so how you what your mindset should be about businesses and then it does go into some specific uh, you know, ways that he calculates or uh, has gone to calculate the value of businesses uh, and, and bonds and that sort of thing. And, and some of it is outdated uh, for sure, but I think it is- It's an old book. But, yeah. but I think it's certainly uh, an, a very, very valuable one. Um, and I believe, uh, was it the, I think it's the intelligent investor, right? That has the, someone's done the, the modern adaption as well for each chapter. Or is it, am I thinking of a different book? Yeah, no, no, you're right. His name, because I've got a quote from him, is Jason, uh, oh, where is it? Come on. Jason Zweig, Z-W-E-I-G. That does help a lot when you get to the end of a chapter. You're kind of halfway there because it's (laughs) written so long ago that you're really struggling. Um, Then Jason comes in and says, oh, so in this chapter- we learned about this and this. And you're like, oh, of course, that's what, ah, uh, yeah. yep, I'm on board. Yeah. Yeah, because he'll be like talking about like modern companies and he's like talking about like an automaker or like he's, he's talking about like a railroad company. And it's like, yeah. what the hell? Like it's hard to like, it's hard to, um, the, the, the stocks he's talking about just seem so old fashioned because obviously it's just yeah. written in the 40s. Uh, and then, yeah, the, yeah. The, it gets kind of, uh, at the end of each chapter, he, this guy um, kind of relates it to modern companies. And I think it was done in the early 2000s. So it's still related to, you know, some internet, it's, you know, positioned around internet companies and, and companies that were, that were exploding around that time. But it gives you uh, a little bit more of an understanding of, uh, of, of the investing principles compared to to some of the examples that Benjamin Graham mm. uses, which are hard to 
hard to kind of appreciate you know, what 70, 80, 80 years later. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm cool. going to, I'm going to take from there, I'm going to take the intelligent investor and I'm going to recommend um, one that's still talks about the same stuff as the intelligent investor, but I believe it's easier to read, especially if you're new starting out. This will come as no surprise to you, Hamish. Um, but the book I'm going to recommend is Rule One by Phil Town. <laughs> <laughs> so as I was talking about with the, with my background to investing, this is uh, one of the first books that really opened my eyes. And, and for those that don't know, Benjamin Graham taught Warren or Warren Buffett learned the Benjamin Graham approach. So it's yeah. like the same approach. It, it, Warren Buffett, granted, he has made some pretty big changes to this value investing approach over time. Um, less of the cigar butts, more of the, you know, the long term high quality businesses at, at fair prices. Mm. Um, but rule one takes all of the same uh, mentalities that you should be ha- taking into your investing. Um, and it just kind of simplifies it. So rule one by Phil Town, I would definitely recommend. It's more just a book that goes through um, the four key pillars of Warren Buffett's value investing approach, that being um, understanding the business, finding a moat, checking the management team and doing a valuation, making sure you've got a margin of safety. Um, but it's very easy to read. And if you're completely new to the stock market, you can <clears throat> you can read that book and you will start to really get a good idea for what this um, what this strategy is all about. Because when I read The Intelligent Investor, it's a great book, don't get me wrong. Um, I think it starts out with like stock allocation versus bond allocation. Mm. <laughs> it's like, oh, so corporate bonds could yield this and government bonds could yield that. So you should split your assets and sums. And I, I, I'm sitting there. I've barely even, I don't even know, like they're talking about coupons. And I'm like, is that like, <laughs> is that like what you, you can hand in at McDonald's? They give, you like, they give you like free fries or something. Yeah. I'm like, what, what the hell is this? So that threw me off real fast yeah. um, back when I first read. Cause I, I tried to battle through it as one of the first books that I read. And I was just like, nope. Do, do, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, but I, I think when I went to um, rule one, I learned a lot of the key principles that come from the intelligent investor, mm. but it was a much easier read. Yeah. And, and the other <laughs> thing that's good about rule one is it leans much more on kind of modern Warren Buffett principles where the the emphasis is on the quality of the business. And that's something you don't get as much of as in, in the intelligent investor, which leans a little bit more onto the deep value, you know, side of, of analyzing businesses. Um, so yeah, rule one books, uh, Phil Towns books, I should say rule one payback time. Um, there's one other one there invested, invested. Um, yeah, they, they give much more of a simplistic approach to, um, you know, the, the principles that Buffett has been talking about. I say modern, but I'm talking about like the last four or five decades, <laughs> um, modern, modern in, as in like the last half of Buffett's life. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, F- F- Phil Town's books are you know f- fantastic. I would always say if you want to analyze individual businesses or just at least learn more about it, that's probably a great way to start because you'll get a nice foundation and you're not going to learn everything that you need to do. You need to know to to be able to do individual analysis. I think very very well over time, but you'll get a really solid foundation and it'll help you then understand the concepts in Intelligent Investor uh, and another resources like another big resource which is in the form of a book but it's also um, available just online for free if you want which is the Berkshire Hathaway annual letters most companies in the annual letters they just talk about the company um, and where they're going in the future Buffett spends a lot of time talking about how he's approaching investment analysis Um, so going through those letters uh, which go all the way back to 1964 is incredibly valuable the book that kind of consolidates the some of the main points is the essays of Warren Buffett again I think I've got it here. uh you'll uh yeah go for it uh you'll uh you'll get if you read Phil Town's books and then you go through the annual letters you'll you'll start to recognize a lot of the concepts that have been simplified in rule 1 um but in the annual letters where Buffett's talking about them it's it's it is a little bit more complex so I think it's a step up from Phil Town for sure uh, it requires a little bit more financial literacy and, and maybe a little bit more, um, you know, just looking up words as you go and, and understanding what certain things mean. Uh, but I think the Berkshire letters, if I had to pick one resource, the Berkshire letters is where I've learned the most because even though it's all in snippets throughout, you know, 
what is it like 50, 55, 60 years of, uh, of different annual letters uh, across time. There's so mm. much, there's so much value there. Uh, it's, yeah. it's kind of crazy. So that's, that's where I would sink my teeth into if you're already, you've already got a basic understanding and you want to, you know, sink your teeth into something. Why not learn from the man himself? Yeah. Yeah. Here it is. You see that? There it is. Yeah. That's it. It's a there great it book. It doesn't have everything that he talks about in the letters, of course, but it puts it into categories. So yeah. it's like what the last section is like valuation. So it's got all of yeah. from across time. Uh, all the things he said about valuation, which is an easier way to read it because you shouldn't, yeah. it doesn't really make any sense to read chronologically. It makes sense to read it in, you know, investing principle and everything he said over the course of time uh, on that particular yeah. principle. It's like corporate governance, finance and investing, <clears throat> investment alternatives, common stock, mergers, acquisitions, yeah. valuation and accounting, yeah. accounting shenanigans. That might be interesting. Yeah. Uh, accounting policy, tax matters. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I found, so, yeah, it just looks like they're all grouped. So, yeah, yeah it's like, like under finance and investing, we've got Mr. Market, arbitrage, uh, debunking standard dogma, value investing, yeah. intelligent investing, cigar butts, life and debt, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, there you go. I actually, I, I've got this. I don't actually think I've read this book. Like <laughs> I've read plenty of Buffett letters, but I haven't actually read this book. Yeah. So, there you go. It's on the list. All right, what have you got? Um, you got another one for us? Or? Oh, yeah, I've, I've got another one. Uh, I'll just quickly mention this. Uh, it's very Warren Buffetty as well, The Dando Investor by Monish Pabrai. Again, I, I, I love books. You know, I'm, I'm not huge on reading, honestly. No. I really don't like it. I used to struggle. Like, I, <laughs> I don't want to sound like I can't read because I definitely can't. <laughs> uh, but as a kid, I, when I was reading books, I used to start reading and then halfway down the page – my eyes are still scrolling across the the words and reading the sentences, but my brain is doing something else. Yeah. <laughs> so literally my eyes are just moving back and forth, but I'm thinking about, I don't know, AFL or so- something else. So yeah. I've always found that. I've never been someone that can just sit down and read a book. Yeah. I just get no, so distracted. I, uh, I'm, I'm the so same. That's why yeah. I love audiobooks. Audiobooks are my jam. I will... Mm absolutely power through a zillion audio books. Um, but if, if it's going to be like, if I'm going to sit down and read a physical book, I definitely want it to be uh, to the point yeah. uh, an easy read. Um, and I think the Dando investor is, is exactly that it's short. It's easy to understand. It's uh, it's kind of a little bit storyified. So there's lots of examples, stories where you can be like, Oh, that makes sense. You know? Mm. Um but it's very much, it's by Monish Pabrai, it's very much just a Warren Buffett style investing book. Yeah. So the, the kind of key phrase from Monish in that book is heads I win, tails I don't lose much, mm-hmm. which is kind of a, a spin on the whole rule one, don't lose money. You know, second rule is don't, don't forget rule number one yeah. kind of thing. Um, so he talks about, in that book, he talks about buying exist- how it's good to buy existing businesses simple, predictable businesses with big moats. He talks about, you know, um, allocating your capital, like betting heavy when the odds are heavily in your favor, um, yep. being fairly concentrated as opposed to like widely diversified. Yeah. He talks about valuation. He talks about margin of safety, essentially just buying what what he would say, 50 cent dollars. Mm. Um, and he goes through, like he goes through the discounted cash flow analysis as well like yeah you will learn that that strat that valuation approach yeah uh, which is very very important yeah for somebody that wants to be a um a value investor like warren buffett yeah like phil town he, he goes through a valuation strategy and it's based on the same principles as a dollar cost averaging approach but it's a little bit different um yeah so actually it's- learning the proper dca from that book, yeah, it is very helpful. Yeah, Filtown uses a very simplified approach. It's basically a simplified discounted cash flow, and I think it's probably a good entry yeah, based point, on earnings. especially if you haven't start. Like, so I, I kind of learned discounted cash flow as a university, so the gap was kind of already bridged. But if you haven't done that kind of maths before, I can appreciate how it would be an entry way, but it is very, mm. very limited. And you probably want to find yourself moving it over from Phil Towns, at least this is my opinion, f- moving on from that to doing more of a, a, a traditional discounted cash flow that you would learn yeah. in finance that is in the Dando Investor uh, relatively quickly if you if you can. Um, 
So yeah, that that's something you definitely get out of that book. Uh, one book yeah. that I read recently, Seven Powers, is a book specifically on. Uh, it's by Hamilton Helmer, and it's specifically on the types of competitive advantages that businesses have, which is kind of one of the four key pillars um, of of Buffett's uh, investing strategy. And the book is really good because it it not only takes you through seven different competitive advantages, but it teaches you how to think about what an advantage should mean. Uh, And each advantage, it breaks it down into a benefit and a barrier. So what is the benefit that this advantage provides the business? So in other words, how does this business make additional higher return on capital or or uh, higher profits than than other businesses? And then uh, what's the barrier that's preventing other businesses from replicating? So not just thinking of it as just a barrier, because a business that is is protected but doesn't actually produce any excess profit is is not that great. And then not just a benefit. There has to be something protecting it, something intrinsic protecting it. Mm. So that book goes through, you know, economies of scale and networking effect and brand and, and cornered resources and all kinds of competitive advantages. And uh, it, it's, it's fantastic. And even just the thinking process uh, helps you to apply that to competitive advantages that aren't included in that book things like switching cost uh, which i don't believe was in the book um you know and other kind of advantages right yeah i tried to listen to that i I would say don't get the audio book for that oh is it no good oh because there's a lot of diagrams and stuff so you you need to yeah there's i saw you i saw you reading it on the plane uh, and you're like yeah it was good so i was like okay i'll I'll get it i downloaded (laughs) the audio book and then it's like this can be calculated by yeah, the calculation X equals pages. left parentheses A plus Z. That's the thing. <laughs> like, so like he, oh no. <laughs> that, that's the thing about the book. You, you don't get turned off by those those pages because he does. He provides he provides you the thinking of um, how to think about the advantage and how it provides advantages in just in words. But then he also shows you in a mathematical way why mm. it's an advantage. Uh, you don't have to get overwhelmed by that. It's a lot of algebra and it's it's complex, but uh, yeah. that's just a mathematical way of showing like this is why like uh, a, a networking of, or, or an economies of scale provides unit advantage over other businesses. So it's, yeah, but yeah, you, on audio book, I could imagine how that would be. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I've stopped reading it for now. I've put a pin in it. I'm going to get the book and I'm going to read because I want to make yeah. sure that I actually see the reasoning yeah. in that because you can't, you cannot listen to an equation. <laughs> it's like, see, it's obvious now. Oh, that it? makes so much Left sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you cannot listen to an equation being read at you and be yeah. like, Oh yeah, I get that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. but no, uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it is a very good book. From the stuff that I was just reading in it, like the first couple of chapters don't have much of that. So no, I thought it was quite good. That's what got me hooked on it. Yeah. So now I need to actually go buy the book. Um, okay, so that's Moat. Um, one book that I actually read very recently. I just finished it last week. Actually, was a hundred baggers. Okay. Have you read a hundred baggers? No, I haven't. No. No. So this is kind of getting away. So Warren Buffett, I think, would have thought a lot more like this a little while back. But now that he's so big and so large, he's not really in the kind of game of finding stocks that can 100x. So this is more, I think this is now more like a Monish Pabri kind of style or even like what Peter Lynch used to talk about finding the, I think he talks about 10 baggers, Peter Lynch. Yeah. Whereas this book's about a hundred baggers, literally stocks that go up a hundred times. Yeah. Um, so I thought it was actually a really good book, and uh, it's very relevant for obviously people like us, where we're not just managing like billions of dollars and just trying to get a modest return. Oh, speak on, for yourself. You know, yeah. Right. All right. <laughs> 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 uh, but it's very relevant for us uh, and uh, people like us that want to follow that Warren Buffett active investing approach and actually make really. S- good returns, you know, because obviously if you can find a hundred bagger and Warren Buffett says something like this, I might, might be still in one of your quotes here. It's just like, you don't need many of those stocks in your lifetime to do very well and, you know, get rich. There's something along those lines. Yeah. But anyway, hundred baggers. So it essentially just talks through a bunch of case studies that go 100 X. And obviously there's companies in different sectors, different businesses. So it's this whole wide variety. So they don't really try and nail down this, you must do this, this, and this, and you will get a hundred bagger. It's more like now that we've talked through these case studies of hundred baggers, Mm. what are some of the like, what are some of the common themes that we can take out of them that, 
you can kind of identify in stocks that you look at that um, that might interest you, you know? Yeah. So I think really the the book is is quite an easy read. It's quite conversational kind of thing. Um, there are two main takeaways, I would say. Um, the first one is that there has to be a lot of growth, which makes sense for a hundred bagger. It has to be a lot of growth and there has mm. to be a long growth runway. Yeah. And they also talk about how the management team has to achieve a high return on equity. They have to uh, they have to achieve a high return on investor capital. When they get those juicy, juicy profits, they have to be able to easily reinvest it and also invest it very, very well. Mm. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. It goes into a lot more detail. It talks about, you know, <clears throat> how in order to achieve a hundred bagger, you have to be very good at not selling <laughs> and that kind of thing. Cause it's like yeah. the average time for a hundred bagger is like 25 to 30 years or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it talks about like when not to sell, mm. how people screw themselves over by selling that kind of thing. Yeah. But I thought that was actually quite an interesting book. So I, I would recommend it. I wouldn't recommend it straight off the bat. I would recommend, you know, you, you maybe read that one later. Yeah. Well, um, on that note, actually, if you want to get a couple of case studies of not 100 baggers, but I think like 25 to 30 baggers, Nick Sleep, uh, who was a fund manager who ran a fund from early 2000s to I think 2014, he invested in basically three companies at the end. Uh, it was Costco, Amazon, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Costco and Amazon both from early 2000s. And then he held them till today. So early 2000s until today, it's like about 20 years. Uh, and I think they've done 20, 30, 40 X or something, each of them. Uh, wow. And in those letters, in the early 2000s, he gives in, in a, a lot of detail uh, about what his thinking was with those businesses. Um, so that's maybe just another way to get some case studies um, of, of kind of businesses that are massive compounders. Um, so, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I haven't read the Nick Sleep letters, but I should. I haven't read all <laughs> of them. Um, I've read like bits and pieces and I've kind of looked at his, his okay. thoughts on, on you know, certain companies. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of value there. Um a lot mm. of detail. They're like they're they're structured like Berkshire Buffett's Berkshire letters, but he just goes through incredible detail. Like he'll he'll show you his discounted cash flow, even why he uses a ten percent discount rate versus anything else. He tells you exactly what he's doing. So, um, right, it's super valuable. Awesome, nice. Uh, one just really quick one um, one book I I cannot leave out. Uh, one up on Wall Street. Mm. This is another one which is very good to read early on. Um, so I'd read Rule One first, and then I'd read One Up on Wall Street after that. It's by Peter Lynch, uh, who we just mentioned before. Um, that is a very, very good book. I just love Peter Lynch so much. Just he, he's just like he just tells it the way it is. So this is a very good book um, for yes, for learning about what you want to look for in businesses, but also what you don't want to do in the stock market. Yeah, like it's a very much an investing kind of mindset. Get your head in the right space. D do this, but do not do this kind of book. Mm. Um, so I was looking through the chapters before. It talks about, uh, you know, how Wall Street is, you know, massively flawed and how you as a small investor have a, a big edge. Uh, it talks about what you need to look for in a business, uh, focuses on, yeah, getting yourself in the right frame of mind to achieve long-term uh, long returns. Um, so on that, he talks about long-term thinking. He talks about, you know, how to avoid the noise and uh, how to not speculate. Uh, I look, chapter 18 is literally called uh, The 12 Silliest and Most Dangerous Things People Stay people say about stock prices. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, uh, I remember reading that, having a bit of a laugh, but yeah, very true. I can can definitely recommend One Up on Wall Street. I recommend it very highly. Mm. Um, any any other ones? We should get to some investing quotes. Any other ones you just want to chuck um, in there real quick, Hamish? Yeah, we'll do, some, we'll do some quick ones. Richer, Wiser, Happier came out last year, I believe, or two years ago. Um, fantastic that was a good book. one. Uh, and then just uh, founder books. So books by the by people who've built companies. Uh, yep. um, really great way to learn more about either the companies you're invested in or just a, an industry that you you have an interest in. So, What are some of the ones you've read? Uh, books? Made from Scratch. It's probably the most recent one by uh, Kent Taylor, the founder of uh, Texas Roadhouse, one of my companies. Uh, yep. so. I read yeah. uh, Alibaba, the house that Jack Ma built. Mm. I thought that was quite interesting as well. It gives you really good context of what Alibaba is because it's quite a hard business to understand. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All right. Let's quickly, right. Uh, we've spent a long time. <laughs> yeah, we we'll, knew this would happen. We'll get, we'll get to a couple. We'll get to a couple of quotes. Uh, we'll just have to pick out maybe one or two each. We'll go back one and forth. One or two. Um, yeah, sure. Do you want so, so, so now, so we've got, so we've done, 
we've done our background, we've done the books and why we like each one of these books. And now these, I think these quotes are almost just going to kind of reaffirm what mm. we we're talking about as to why we like the books that we just recommended. Yeah. And it's good, it's good as a beginner investor to get kind of get your head space in 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 this in this headspace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll uh, um, I'll start off with a with a with a simple one. Um, this is yeah. a Charlie Munger quote. Simplicity is has a way of improving performance by enabling us to better understand what we're doing. Um, and yeah. I think this applies this doesn't just apply to investing. This applies to pretty much everything that you do, I think, having simplicity in your life and 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 trying to plan out things in a simple way uh, has a lot of value. Uh, it's certainly something yeah. I've done like with my routine. I, I think having a routine in the morning and, and in the evening is super valuable, but I try and keep it just to a couple of key building blocks, not this complex, like wake up, then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do this over three minutes. It's not super complex. Mm. It's just, what do I want to get done in the space of the first two hours of the day? I want to get some exercise done. I want to have a shower. I want to, you know, eat breakfast. I want to maybe read something. So having kind of some key, keeping it simple uh, in, in terms of your routine and habits, I think helps kind of build them. Um, but the same thing applies for, for directly into, into businesses. Um, investing in simple businesses, I think is a, mm. is a good thing to do, not just if you're a beginner, but for anybody, because it means that you're far more likely to have a deeper understanding of, of how the company works and its competitors. Yeah. Uh, and then also just investing keeping your portfolio simple, investing in a few businesses so that you have a deep understanding of, of them and, and always know what's going on. You're always on top of uh, the businesses kind of that you own. Um, so I think that's mm. a, I think simplicity is, is, a, is a valuable kind of lesson in investing. That is a massive theme in all of the books that we were just <coughs> recommending. Pretty much all those books we talked about have some sort of chapter. Richer, Wiser, Happier, Dando, Investing, uh, Rule One, all of them have a chapter on just keeping it simple. Yeah, because I don't know why, but it is the trend when you're new to investing, you're drawn to like complicated stuff. Yeah. I don't know why. It's like, oh, we should do invest in this thing that's super comp. No, it's just yeah. it's like, look at Alibaba, how many businesses they own. That's complicated. Look at Tencent, how many businesses they own. That's flipping complicated. <laughs> look at Facebook, they sell ads. They're making investments in the metaverse. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Straightforward. Like nine, what is it? What it was ninety seven and a half percent of their revenue is made from selling ads. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> they own four apps. They sell ads on those four apps. Yeah, yeah. Simplicity, very simple. Um, you got another one? Uh, you can you can do one if you want. I don't want to. I don't want to suck up I'll all do of one. the time. Um, well, the, my my classic go tos are, are you know. Rule number one, this is Warren Buffett quote, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two is don't forget rule number one. And this is basically, so, this is something that a lot of people don't really realize at the start. They always think about investing as trying to pick a winner. Investing is half picking winners. In fact, I'd argue it's less than half picking winners. It's more than half about avoiding losers. And I think this ties in very, very nicely with a quote from Benjamin Graham that I like print this out, stick it up on your wall. Um, the quote is, an investment operation is one uh, is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and an adequate return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. Yeah. So it's not just about achieving a return. It's about the safety of principle. Yeah. I mean, good, solid investing is non-speculative. It is protecting what you've already got because most of your money in, in this life is probably going to be made by going to work. So save up your money, protect mm. that, and then try and get just a modest return on top of that to, to push you further forward. Yeah. I think that was a, a really key, like a fundamental lesson that I learned about investing yeah. that I'll never, ever forget. And that ties right into why businesses with a competitive advantage is, or, or looking for businesses with a competitive advantage is so critical because maybe the business won't grow as you expect. You have these, these ideas mm. of it's going to expand in this way, but as long as it has a deep competitive advantage, the likelihood that that business is going to decline or deteriorate is low. Yep. And that's very different to a business that might shoot for the moon, but also might just go bankrupt if they if they miss. Uh, and I think that's key. It's, it's obviously you want to find businesses with potential for, for opportunity to expand, to, to grow and compound. But uh, are they protected from competition with what they've got? So in the worst case, 10 years from now, 
it's still just an amazing business chugging along uh, and it's not out of business. So, um, yeah. yeah, very It important. also ties in really well to valuation. Yes. Like, don't go messing around with stuff that, sure, it might be promising the world, but it's also like super expensive. Yeah. I mean, one of the best ways to, to mitigate uh, your, your risk of losses is to buy something that's already incredibly undervalued. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, solid business, like what you're saying. It's got a moat. <clears throat> you know, it's got low debts. It's just crazy. But also, it has to be super, super cheap. It's crazy how much that you could literally take this quote and blend it into any part of the investing process. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of like pa- buying a stock at a margin of safety is like, it's kind of like setting the high jump bar lower, right? You you know, mm. that maybe you're, maybe the jumper can jump 1.8 meters, but if you're buying the stock at 1.2, like all he has to do is jump over 1.2. It's very likely he's going to achieve that. Yeah. The lower the bar, the lower the expectation for performance. Uh, whereas most of the time people are buying, you know, a jumper can jump 1.8 and they're paying... 1.85. So he, he might he might jump over it. Maybe he impresses, uh, but mm. he might just hit the bar and and, and miss. So, um, yep. yeah. I know we're running a little bit over time already. It's crazy how much we've spoken <laughs> in this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but g- g- let's do one more each. Give me one more. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, where, where, where did I want to go from here? I don't know. You can do any um, of them. Oh, yeah, this is just a classic Warren Buffett one. Uh, only buy something you'd be perfectly happy to hold if the market shut down for 10 years. Uh, yeah. And even though it's quite simple, there's actually quite a lot of layers involved in, in or there's a number of principles involved in that. Um, yeah, there is. Thinking like a business owner. Um, so basically buying something as if there might not be a stock market. Obviously, there is, which is great. We can invest in businesses easily. But think of it like you're just buying the whole business, like you're buying a property, right? There's no market. You're looking at the business as if it produces profit, like a property produces rental income, and you don't need to yeah. sell it to somebody else. Uh, you don't need a market, right? It, it, yeah, you it, just it, it works. What are you going to get out of yeah, it you're as, not, as the owner? You're not trying to flip the stock or, or flip the property. You're just looking at the property and thinking, uh, how much can I rent this out for? And can I increase rents over time? Uh, or can I renovate it and then increase rents? That sort of thing. Uh, there's long-term thinking, of course, baked into that. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then the idea, of, of course, of buying quality businesses, businesses that are uh, would still be solid in 10 years. Um, so businesses with deep competitive advantages. So I love that quote. I think it has, you know, a number of elements of, of investing that are really important. Mm. And it also ties into what I'm, what I'm going to talk about now is that the, the stock market is a wild place. <laughs> and I don't have a quote exactly, but it's Benjamin Graham, as we're talking about, Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor, chapter eight, I think, he he, he brings in this idea of Mr. Market. Mm. And Mr. Market, you know, is is just a, a dude that comes along over your fence every morning and he just shouts numbers at you, what he'd be willing to buy your stocks from you at that day. Mm. And some days he will come over and he'd be super happy. He's like, look, I'm going to pay you a thousand bucks for those shares. Another day he might come, he's just super depressed. And he's like, look, man, the world's going to explode. The economy's falling apart. I, I'm only going to offer you $10. And it's like, that's, that's the stock market. The stock market's yeah. just telling you what what the bidders are willing to buy the shares at right now. Yeah. But it doesn't tell you anything about the business. So there's going to be some times where the 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 uh, price is extremely high, sometimes where the price is extremely low. But if you can go back to that Buffett quote that you said before um, and just think like the business owner, not worry about it, focus on the cash flows coming out of the business and what you actually own, not you don't own a stock, but you own a business, Mm. then that's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest lesson of, of investing like Warren Buffett. Yeah. I've got a quote here just quickly. This is by Jason Zweig, the guy that does the the yeah, end of yeah. chapter kind of summaries. He says, the market is a pendulum that forever swings between unsustainable optimism, which makes stocks too expensive, and unjustified pessimism, which makes them too cheap. The intelligent investor is a realist who sells to optimists and buys from pessimists. Yeah. Or if so. you're Charlie Munger, you just buy from pessimists and forget the other part of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's it. You don't even need yeah. to worry about the second half of it. Just as long as you're buying from from people who are over pessimistic, you can acquire ownership in in amazing companies and hold them for whatever Charlie's favorite holding period is forever. Or is it? Yeah, it might exactly have been a Buffett right. quote. One of those two. A yeah. Cu- couple more Buffett quotes as well. Uh, 
exactly along the same line. Remember that the stock market is manic depressive. That's kind of what we're just talking about. And the last one is, of course, price is what you pay and value is what you get. Mm. So price is just whatever's going on, Mr. Market, whatever he says, but value, that's what you're, that's what you're getting. You're getting the business. Um, so always focus on the business. Anyway, that, um, that's pretty good. That's so should we round it out there. Yeah, we'll round it out there. Hope, hopefully, you guys got some value out of uh, today's uh, episode. It was a little bit different to to our typical kind of news uh, episode. So hope, hopefully, there's some value, and we're always welcome to hear feedback. Um, you know, in the in the comment section, feedback's probably a little bit easier through the YouTube comment section. But or as mm-hmm. always, if you have questions uh, for uh, next week's episode, we didn't get to any today, but um, we'll, we'll do our best to to get to some next week. Uh, you can ask them either on the YouTube comment section uh, or on Spotify. If you're listening on Spotify or watching on Spotify, I should say. Um, so yeah, ask away if you have any questions and we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, thanks ShareSite as always for sponsoring sharesite.com forward slash young investors. You can sign up to a free plan uh, and even that helps to support the podcast. So we appreciate um, if you guys uh, use that link. Uh, thanks Brandon for joining me as always. Oh, good. That was fun. Yeah, that was good. I'm, uh, I'm all podcasts out now. I've done two podcasts in two days. So. Yeah, you've done a lot. <laughs> you've done a lot. Uh, no, yeah. Well, we. Go have a rest. Have a have a have a we'll having having a break next week. Um, so well, That's not not true. for you guys. There's no break next week for you guys. There's um, no break. No, there's no yeah, break ever. Yeah. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> yeah, we're never gonna stop. No, no. But yeah, no. We should we should have timed it perfectly. So next week's episode, we will be back to regular scheduled programming, doing the news, seeing what's going on. Hopefully, the world hasn't fallen apart. Yeah, but uh, I don't know if it has then. You can rest assured I'll be buying some stocks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. See you later, guys. All right. We'll see you guys next time.